yesterday we were talking about exegesis and hermeneutics and homiletics, and we were suggesting that that in fact there has been a change that has taken place in the last years, and and it's it, within homiletics at least we're no longer tending to see these as three sequential movements, the three 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 movements, exegesis and then hermeneutics and then homiletics at the tail end of the process, but rather we're seeing them more as parallel activities that happen simultaneously and need to be attended to, each with its own discretion, each with its own integrity, uh, but there's a way in which the goal that we are working for as preachers affects the very process of our sermon preparation right from the beginning. The, the, the goal that we have when we are interpreting a biblical text is different from the goal that we might have in a biblical class where we're doing an exegesis in scholarly ways for scholarly academic purposes. The goal, the end point, affects the process from the beginning. I had a, a student once in my early classes, not the class that you were in, Tim, and he was concerned when we talked about exegesis and historical critical study of the text. He was concerned because he said that exegesis meant exit Jesus. <laughs> and, and while I tended at the time to dismiss his notion, it's also one that I've come back to, to appreciate more deeply what he was saying. He, he was certainly experiencing or expressing a mistrust of, of the intellectual, and uh, I hope that by the end of the course he appreciated that the Holy Spirit can work as much through our study of scholars and scholarly endeavor with the biblical text as in praying over the text. But he was, he was making an important point, and that is that the text as we have it already has a certain theological weight, a certain ability to speak to the faith. And sometimes, after we've done our exegetical studies, if, if we don't go beyond historical critical endeavor, if we don't go beyond tearing the text apart, we can end up with something that is that denudes the text of its ability to speak of Jesus. So there can be a way in which he was, in fact, correct. So our subject tonight is moving on from historical critical exegesis, or historicizing the text, to theologizing the text, another process that we have to engage, and yet it's one that has been much neglected, certainly in my own tradition, probably less so here from what I'm gathering, because from what I understand, in the biblical classes there isn't a desire to separate out the faith from the instruction of the text. Or there isn't a lack of confidence on the part of your instructors to speak of the Bible as the Word of God. But for many people in biblical studies today, to speak of the Bible as revelation is very awkward because the parameters of the discipline do not encourage it. It's an historical endeavor. History looks for data, and faith is not data. So, as preachers, we need to be quite intentional about theologizing the text, and we're going to also be talking about the gracious nature of the text. But there are several ways of us doing theology in terms of our preaching, several ways of, of incorporating theology in our preaching and bringing it to the biblical text, and I want to just mention quickly four different ways, and, and one of them has to do with doctrine, preaching a particular doctrine. When we identify a theme sentence, for our sermon, we've probably, anyone who's taken a homiletics course has been given the instruction that you should be able to say what your sermon is about in one sentence. And one of the things that we can be confident of, if we have such a sentence, 
is that there's a particular doctrine in systematic theology, or constructive theology, however we refer to it, there's a particular doctrine, a traditional teaching of the church, that says something that is very close to the theme that we are trying to pronounce. If we can identify what that doctrine is, then our preaching will be much enriched. Because a very simple device that we can follow, we can go to a, a systematic theology volume, uh, we, can, we can look up the doctrine that we have just identified, we can read about it, even if we read only a few pages a week of systematic theology. It may not make its way directly into the sermon, or it may. But what it is going to do, week after week, is it's going to help us ask deeper questions, take us to a more profound place. And you know, if we start this early on in our ministry, our own ability to reflect theologically is going to be so much more increased over the years. And people will turn to us for our wisdom and understanding. So one way of, of uh, bringing theology into our sermons is to identify a particular doctrine. A, a second way that we might also consider has to do with this theme sentence. What I suggest for students is that it's not, not enough simply to have a theme sentence. We need to have a theme sentence that focuses where the sermon needs to focus. We need to have a theme sentence that focuses on God. So identify God as the subject of that sentence. Make it a short sentence, not a complex sentence. Just a very compact sentence, no more perhaps than five or six words. God is the subject. Use an active verb, as active as possible. And there's a good reason for this. Because if it is an active verb, it gives us something in the pews. It gives us something to see, something to visualize. We can envision God acting in a particular way. Some words like is, God is love, but of course, those are, are, that's an important theme sentence for, for some sermon. But it can also be understood to be a passive kind of relationship. And God's relationship to us is never passive. Try for an active verb wherever possible. God heals the woman. God offers, Jesus offers salvation. The Holy Spirit comes to the church. So, try for a theme sentence that has God in one of the three persons of the Trinity as the subject of the sentence. So that's a, a very helpful way of, of uh, making sure that our texts focus theologically. If we don't have God in our theme sentence, then there's no reason to expect that we'll have God in our sermon. A third way of bringing theology into our preaching has to do with sermon structure. When we structure the sermon, our theology can be shaped by the shape of the sermon. Throughout history, the structure of the sermon has typically been seen to be neutral theologically. It has no particular value. And yet what I would suggest is that, that what we see in the traditional form of preaching is a form that predicts the kind of theology we are going to proclaim. We've just never stopped to look at it. A traditional way of preaching, a time-honored way of preaching, is to do exposition first and application. The, the, the actual description of the, the form is a little bit longer. Usually it's introduction, exposition, a bridge from then to now, application, and conclusion. But essentially it's a two-part sermon, exegesis, or exposition, application. And that is a very effective way of preaching. Because first of all, we start with the Bible, 
And we depend on the Bible for, for the instruction that we are going to say. It's not our own word, it's God's word that we proclaim. And then we move to how that got that word it, it is evident today. How it might be expected to change our lives. The problem with that is that if we go to the biblical text only once in our preaching, if we only enter into the text one time, chances are, nine times out of ten, we will emerge with the trouble, the demand of the text upon us. We'll emerge with an identification of sin, some way in which Israel is at fault, some way in which we as God's people have failed. But we may not have, have obeyed a certain command. We may have strayed. We may have ignored God. We may have ignored our neighbors. And so the, the just choosing that form of sermon, exposition, application, we have chosen an anthropocentric theology. A theology that focuses on people and not on God. We've never stopped to look at how the sermon shape that we choose actually dictates some of the theology we proclaim. One of the things that we can be sure is that when we look to the gospel, we look to it for words of correction. We never expect to go to the gospel and, and find God saying to us, Ah, there, there, my beloved children. You're doing just perfectly. Continue on on your righteous ways. We always expect, and rightly expect, a word of correction. So if we go to the text once, we're going to end up preaching a word of judgment. In nearly every sermon form, there is nothing inherent in the form itself to encourage anything but an anthropocentric leaning, something that puts the burden on the people. And there's very little in any sermon form that we traditionally look at that encourages an examination of what God is doing and the way in which God has met the burden in Jesus Christ. So, what I am suggesting is that we need to take a deliberate turn toward God in our own approach to preaching. And we need a sermon form that is going to help the struggling preacher and indeed the accomplished preacher to be a better theologian <coughs> so, theology can be driven by the sermon shape. It can also be driven by the biblical text. Some of us might feel, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, um, I, I'm going to preach a, a sermon that is a hopeful sermon if my text ends on a word of hope. That too can be a way of theologizing, and we leave it more or less up to the biblical text. But you know, there isn't any biblical text that I know of taken, read in, in the appropriate kind of understanding that, that expands it beyond a simple verse. There's, there's no text that I know of that can't be read, both from the perspective of what we must do, and also from the perspective of what God does. The grace that God offers. The grace that God empowers. Even, in, even with a psalm where there is, um, the, uh, the, the psalmist is expressing anger towards God, there is a word of grace embedded in that, in that the psalmist knows that this God is a loving God who isn't going to turn away. From, from the inmost, innermost feelings of, of resentment and anger, God is big enough to take even this, and God wants that as an offering. Another way that we uh, sometimes uh, determine theology within the sermon is uh, it's not just driven by the biblical text, 
uh, or by the sermon shape. It can also be driven by the preacher's mood. The preacher may say, well, it's been a pretty rough week. I had trouble with the board on Tuesday. I think I'm going to give them trouble on Sunday. <laughs> and, and the preacher takes out a legitimate kind of anger and resentment towards some of the members of the congregation through the sermon. Entirely inappropriate as a way of pastoring. Uh, if we have anger and resentment towards the congregation or congregational members, then, then the place to work that out is with a counselor. But our task as pastors is always to love, to challenge for sure, but to challenge in love and to empower the congregation to their works of ministry. So, a, a final, and this is, this is where I put my emphasis, a, a, another way of doing, of shaping theology in the sermon is to allow the gospel message to be that which determines the theological shape of the sermon. And by the theological shape, I mean the deep grammar of the sermon. Not, not the evident shape that when you look at it you say, oh, that's this and this and this, but a grammar that, you're hard, that a congregational member would hardly be even aware of. But they would be aware that they had heard the gospel because of this direction. And it is a movement within preaching from trouble to grace. So my overall recommendation tonight that's going to be reappearing toward the end of our lecture is that the sermon move uh, from an anthropocentric focus in the first part of the sermon, that is there would be exposition, application, first half of the sermon. It's going to be focused on the things that we have to do, and that's what I call theological trouble. Trouble puts the burden on us as people to change before God. And then I'm suggesting a second part of the sermon, a second half that goes back to the biblical text, this time determining what God is doing to enable the people to meet the demand. Another exegesis or exposition of the text and another application that again comes to our world and identifies grace in our world, how God continues to act in those ways today. So it's a, for lack of a better metaphor, it's a four-page model, but it's less than a four, more than a four-page model, it's a deep grammar for whatever form of sermon <coughs> we choose, whether it's a point form of sermon, whether it's a, a jewel form of sermon, whether it's narrative, whether it's a topical sermon or a doctrinal sermon, let it be one that takes both sides of God's Word. God's Word, at any one moment, is a Word that both condemns and liberates. A <coughs> couple of things that this is not. First of all, we aren't creating in the first half of the sermon this, this trouble that puts the burden on us. We aren't, we aren't creating this simply as a way of erasing it in the second half when we look to what God is doing. This stands on its own as a certain kind of truth. Yes, we are sinners. And then the grace is the second half of the sermon. And grace, the simplest definition I give of grace is that grace puts the burden on God. And God's already accepted that burden in Jesus Christ. Grace puts the burden on God. So, but in, in looking now to what God is doing, we are not looking as something that erases this trouble, but rather something that stands alongside it. Yes, we are sinners, and yes, we are saved, and as St. Paul says, it's in the tension between the two that we work out our salvation in fear and trembling. It's not one, and then it's erased, 
for a rhetorical effect or dramatic effect, and this one only is the truth, they're both true. It's a tensive relationship that we're pointing to. A, a second thing that this is not, it's not Old Testament, New Testament. As the, the traditional wording that has been used for trouble and grace has, has, has been law and gospel. And Luther, certainly, in the early part of his own uh, theological career, can identified law as Old Testament and gospel as New Testament, but he came to, to repent of that understanding, came to a, a newer understanding when he realized that when he was reading about people in the Old Testament, he was reading about real people. Because they didn't have historical critical exegesis, they, they had very limited means of getting back to those people behind the text. But he came to understand, as he studied the text, and indeed was on the, the, the uh, early wave of historical criticism arising, he came to understand that those were real people who had legitimate hope of salvation in themselves. That, in other words, the people in the Old Testament were very much like you and me. So he changed his mind and continued to speak about law and gospel. But law and gospel, he said, were found in both Testaments. Another thing that this approach is not, it is not problem-solution. The first half, here's the problem. Second half, here's the solution. That's a very easy kind of natural stereotype to make. But the gospel is never an answer to a problem. The gospel is a relationship with your Savior. The gospel is, is, is inviting people, here is, here is the depth of our problem, the depth of our sin, the depth of our violation of God's intent for humanity, and here is this relationship with God uh, that is open to us, that, we, that God is walking with us, uh, opening the doors, liberating us in, in, in countless kinds of ways. It's not a solution, it's the path. If we walk with this one, we will discover the solution in time. But the gospel is never a solution or an answer to a problem in itself. It's rather a relationship that is offered in and through the preaching. So, three things that this approach is not. Now I want to turn to uh, <coughs> some of the histor history behind this, this notion of trouble and grace, because it can be a very foreign notion to us, and uh, particularly when we consider that the typical way of speaking about it has been law and gospel. Certainly St. Paul spoke about this in the book of Romans in particular. Augustine spoke about it. For Augustine, law and gospel was one of the senses of scripture. You could look at any biblical text, he said, and discern that there was both a, what I'm calling a trouble dimension and a grace dimension. Ask almost any preacher what a law and gospel sermon is, and you will get, if they've ever heard of it, they, you will get one of two answers. They will say it's a Lutheran sermon, and it's a sermon that moves from law to gospel. In fact, that understanding is very common amongst members of the Academy of Homiletics that Barry and I belong to. In conversations with colleagues, that's, uh, those are typical responses, and, and yet, both answers are wrong. It is not a Lutheran form of sermon. It never has been. And Lutherans have never seen it move from law to gospel. I want to give you a little, but, uh, where, where I'm going with this, I want to just touch a little bit on the history because it will help us both to understand what the terms mean and also clarify what is happening today in, in homiletics on these very ideas. 
I'm going to skip over Paul, Augustine, Luther, John Wesley, all of whom said, or at least Luther and, and Wesley said that this was the way to preach law and gospel. And I'm going to go to the foremost interpreter of Luther on these matters, Professor C. F. W. Walthers at Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri during the latter half of the 1800s. Now, it was often Professor Walther's Friday night hobby to offer lectures to the seminary students. And he offered these lectures as a way of keeping them close by and giving them an edifying evening rather than the evening that they might have if they had gone downtown. We do not know with what joy the students would file into the lecture hall every Friday night. And we do not know what other entertainment they would have liked to have been enjoying. We only know that from September the 12th, 1884, to November the 6th, 1885, Walthers devoted 39 lectures to interpreting Luther. A stimulating evening if you ever heard one. <laughs> and his subject was the proper distinction between law and gospel. Thirty-nine times the students filed into the halls to hear the proper distinction between law and gospel. And these were published posthumously in German in 1897 from stenographic student notes. Students took detailed notes during these things just to keep awake. <laughs> now he said that law and gospel are a means of bringing people to conversion. Law, he says, addresses the conscience and discloses an individual's sin. And without law written in the heart, the gospel cannot be heard. The law, he says, exists as a threat and this he says rather beautifully about Abraham and Hagar. He says, as with Abraham and Hagar, the law hands us a piece of bread and drives us out into the desert. Thank you. The gospel, by contrast, demands nothing at all. The gospel demands nothing at all but invites a hungry person to come to eat at the table and to partake of heavenly blessings. The law, he says, tells us what we must do while the gospel speaks only, only of what God does. Now for Walthers, law is to be preached to those people who are unrepentant sinners. Law is to be preached as a way of convicting people of their sin. And gospel, he says, is, is to be preached to those people who are already repentant. But he said that the real test of a sermon is to separate out law and gospel so that the person who is the unrepentant sinner hears the word of condemnation and knows that that word is for him or her. And Similarly, the gospel is to be preached in such a way that the person who has repented receives that word as distinctly to them. That's the appropriate distinction that he was talking about, the test of a, a good sermon. He did not conceive of, the whole, of both of those addressing both groups of people. You put both in because both were before you, the unrepentant sinner and the repentant one. This was not a sermon form that moved from law to gospel. We don't have time to trace through all of the history of law and gospel through Lutheran homiletics. Um, let me just make one more comment from Walther's. He says that in Luther's sermons, 
In Luther's sermons, there's law and gospel on every page, and he makes it sound like he, he wants students to read Luther's sermons because it's like going to the fair, he says. It's, it, it's almost like taking a roller coaster ride. He says, on every page, first Luther scares the living daylights out of you and hurls you down into the depths. But he's hardly done that when he says, do you believe that? Yes. Good. Come back up, and there is thunder and lightning, and then immediately the gentle breath of the Holy Spirit in the gospel. Ah, he says it's impossible to resist. He constantly preaches law and gospel side by side, so that the law is illustrated in a far more terrifying way by the gospel, and the gospel is made far sweeter and more consoling through the law. This is on every page, so it isn't a sermon form that moves from law to gospel. Well, I'm going to skip over many people who have discussed law and gospel through the ages, primarily Lutheran homileticians, M. Roy. Karl Barth, in 1935, wrote an essay that in, in which he, it was about the time when he was dismissed from Bonn University for failing to take an oath of allegiance to Adolf Hitler. And he wrote a famous paper entitled Gospel and Law, in which he argued that the proper order was not law and gospel, but was gospel, law, gospel. Many of my colleagues in homiletics have taken that as an indication that Bart was against a, 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 a particular form of sermon that moved from law to gospel. In fact, Bart was not talking about the form of sermon. He was talking about the church and its need to resist the laws of the Third Reich. He said the gospel calls us to a certain place that, that the laws must be righteous of the land. So it must be gospel, law, and that leads to gospel. He wasn't talking about a sermon form. It isn't... Um, In 1978, Hermann G. Stumpfle at Luther Theological Seminary in Gettysburg wrote a book called Preaching Law and Gospel. It was a transformative book for me in my own seminary studies, Preaching Law and Gospel. And it was transformative not because he was suggesting that the movement of the sermon should be from law to gospel, but he talked rather about two kinds of law. I don't use the word law, I use the word trouble, simply because law is too easily confused with the Old Testament. But he talks about two kinds of trouble, or two kinds of, of uh, law. The, the one kind is, is the vertical kind. It's the kind that we normally associate with trouble or law in the Bible. It's God up above, us down below. We have come before the court of God, and we have been found wanting. We've been found guilty. God has pronounced us guilty from on high. It's law as a vertic on a vertical axis. And there's an appropriate kind of gospel for that, he said. It's the gospel of forgiveness. If someone says, please forgive me, the gospel that's appropriate to that is you are forgiven. What he does is he opens up, however, the possibility of understanding law so that it also includes social issues, uh, horizontal dimension uh, of, of judgment in our midst, which is every bit as biblical as, as the vertical kind of trouble. The horizontal trouble holds a mirror up to us and allows us to see our own reflection. So when this mirror is held up before us, we see ourselves as fallen creatures. We see the ways in which we permit cycles of, of, of welfare to continue, or cycles of violence in families to continue, or, or wars to keep on repeating. We, we see the fallenness of our nature and we understand that it is because of something that we are deep into or that is deep into us, the nature of our sin. But there is a particular kind of gospel that is appropriate to that. Someone comes to you and you're holding up the mirror the, the, the law as, as a mirror of our existence. Someone comes to you who is homeless, you don't say, you are forgiven. 
That's not the appropriate kind of gospel to proclaim. It's a, another kind of gospel is necessary on this horizontal plane, and it's, it's the gospel that overturns the powers of this world. So that you say to the homeless person, there is a home for you. Or there is a family that is awaiting. Or there is a meal for you. You say to the, the person who is estranged, there is a community for you. To the person who is ill, you say there is healing. You pronounce the kind of good news that is appropriate. Well, that was a fairly revolutionary move in terms of the, the history of, of law and gospel, because as we saw in CFW Walther's, law was a kind of a, a way of what we would call manipulating in, in, that, in, in the way Walther's was using it. It was manipulating people to feel guilty, and then once they felt guilty, then you would offer them the gospel, which would make them feel better. This understanding is, that Stumpfler gave was a, a very deeply enriching possibility, and it opened doors because it allowed us as preachers to realize that when we are in the pulpit, we do have a responsibility to preach judgment. We know that. We, there is a kind of correction that is needed, but it doesn't have to be the finger-wagging, vertical sort of, uh, uh, of finger-wagging that requires that the preacher become the critical parent. That the preacher take on an authority that the preacher doesn't want to take on because it's an awkward place. Rather, this, this allows the preacher to be with the congregation underneath the word, not over the congregation with the word. The horizontal dimension of trouble allows us to be with our congregation and to be seeking that same word of grace that we are trying to proclaim. Well, there was an, one other book that was very significant in 1977, one year before Herman G. Stumpfler. Stumpfler was a Lutheran. He did not advocate, even, th even though he was talking about preaching law and gospel, it was not a sermon form for him. The, it was always what it was and has been in, in Lutheran homiletics. It's a way of doing theology within the sermon. It is not a prescription for how the sermon is shaped. The first person to develop the sermon movement of law to gospel or trouble to grace was an Episcopalian, Milton Crum. Manual on Preaching, 1977. And this was a book that didn't have very much homiletical impact when it was published, partly because it was so obtuse. Milton Crumb had the gift of insight, but not the ability to teach. He had wonderful insights, but his, his homiletical method was so complicated, it was, almost like, it was almost like taking the top off of a computer and looking inside. I think students, any student who picked up that book was probably less inspired to be a preacher after reading it than they were before. But he had some excellent ideas. And uh, I've, there's a handout. Have you received the handout? I, I'm not going to spend a long time on it, but I do want to use Milton Crumb as a way of talking about some of the developments in recent homiletics and talk, illustrating the way in which he, in fact, anticipated so much of what is going on today. He had, Milton Crumb, had a, uh, uh, recommended a particular form of sermon right at the beginning of narrative preaching. And I think he was inspired, he never says he was inspired, I think he was inspired by a book by Robert Scholes and Robert Kellogg, published in 1966, Oxford University Press, The Nature of Narrative, one of the plots that is identified in that book as central to narrative is a very simple plot, complication, resolution. And we see with Milton Crumb, he has situation, complication, resolution. And this is the way in which he was recommending that preachers 
go about composing their sermon. Start with a situation. And the situation is that what he said was, was the human situation all mucked up with sin after the fall. And then the complication, the complication looks at the symptomatic behavior that needs transformation by the gospel. It, it looks to the root of the problem. It, it looks to why it is that we behave in these sinful ways, and what are the consequences if we continue on in that direction. And then the resolution for him was the gospel content. You bring in the gospel. And this speaks to the root of behavior in order to effect a transformation in the heart and minds of people. And then finally, he suggested that there are new results that need to be talked about. New results. If, that if we follow the way of Christ, these consequences will be ours by way of promise. Now, Crum tries to keep the sermon process very fluid and free, but in trying to accomplish this, his whole process grinds to a halt. And in the end, what he calls his dynamic process just becomes too weighted down and unwieldy. Students are left standing by the sermon roadside, uncertain whether to walk, hitch a ride, or steal a car. Now, over the next two decades, Crum would influence or anticipate the work of Eugene Lowry, Richard Lisher, and myself. And I identify these connections not to elevate Crum or to make his work or ours more significant than it is, but it is to say that with Crum, the Law Gospel School becomes, in theory at least, an overall movement of the sermon. Now, Eugene Lowry, you can see his five stages. Any of you have, who ever came across his, his small book called The Homiletical Plot may remember the diagram right on the cover. It, the diagram goes like this. It's, it's really an, an, an ichthus, the, the, the Greek fish, on its nose. It comes down like this and moves up like this. The homiletical plot. It's really what has become known as Lowry, the Lowry Loop. It starts with upsetting the equilibrium, analyzing the discrepancy is still part of the way down, and at the bottom there's, there's disclosing the key to resolution, which is the gospel. And then on the way up, it's experiencing the gospel, and the final swing is anticipating the consequences. And anyone who looked at that as a sermon model might well have thought that what he was talking about was a 50-50 split between law and gospel. You can see the, the way in which Eugene Lowry is actually drawing on Crum, and he's simplifying Crum in a way that Crum probably would have liked to have been able to simplify himself. But Lowry, while well, Lowry has one footnote that acknowledges he's read Crum, he does not give Crum the credit for his own five stages. But Lowry, what Lowry did is, is he indicated a very distinct turning point, a reversal point that is, I think, a crucial understanding of what happens when we get to that midway point in our preaching. Now, Lowry has since come out with another book called uh, Dancing the Edge of Mystery, in which he clarifies that his plot is not meant to be a 50-50 split. In fact, what he's meaning is, is really that it's, there's this turnaround, and this turnaround, he says, might be at the last in the last um, sixth of the sermon, almost right at the end. And to me, to my way of thinking, and, and he says that some, sometimes that reversal can take place in the very last line. I think that is what I find is the primary problem with that approach to preaching, because he's not talking about a theological movement, he's talking about a dramatic movement. He wants the drama of the sermon to be saved to the end, and right at the end, you release the gospel, and somehow people are saying, ah, aha, now it all makes sense. And that is not the purpose of preaching. The purpose of preaching is not for the congregation at the end of the sermon suddenly to discover what the preacher has been talking about. 
The purpose of, the, of preaching is to preach God and God's good news into the lives of people. And that's why it needs to be a theological movement and, and not something that's just tacked on at the end. It needs to start right from the middle of the sermon. We need to start proclaiming God. Who God is and what God is doing in this particular text and, and also in our world. And it's only by such, such intentional focus and 50-50 split that by the end of the sermon we can expect that our people are going to now have a sense of what it looks like, wh where we might expect to see God operating in our own lives. It's not adequate at the end of a sermon simply to say, oh, but there is good news. Jesus Christ died for us on the cross, and now go out and be a follower of Christ. Because there is no empowerment in that. It takes half the sermon to develop that understanding of, of how God works and the trust that God continues to work today so that when we go out, we are more hopeful than when we came in. I'm always grateful to my father for it. The constant word that he would say at the end of the sermon, he was a minister himself, and he would say, well, what was the hope in that? What was the hope? I think it's a legitimate hope for us to go away from church less angry than we were when we came, with, with a sense of the burden being lifted from us, walking lighter because of who is walking with us. Richard Lisher um, wrote after Crumb, but he was also influenced by Crumb. Crumb said, gave these words to describe the movement of the sermon. Sermons, like the biblical story, will move from fallen humanity in the first half to redeemed humanity, from sin to faith, from darkness to light, from what Paul calls living according to the flesh to living according to the spirit, from condemnation to justification, from alienation to sanctification. Richard Lisher is a, a Lutheran who was teaching at a Methodist school. Three years after, no, four years after Crumb's book came out, he, dis, he suggested this as the movement of the sermon. Through one or more of the following sets of antitheses, chaos to order, bondage to deliverance, rebellion to vindication, despair to hope, guilt to justification, debt to forgiveness, separation to reconciliation, Wrath to love, judgment to righteousness, defeat to victory, death to life. All of these are ways of talking about trouble to grace or law to gospel. One of the things that uh, Richard Lisher helped us understand is, is that what we're talking about when we're using trouble and grace is a deep grammar for the sermon. It's not an evident structure unless you make it so. It's a deep grammar that can be used with whatever form of sermon you want, but it ensures that the focus accomplishes what, it, what, what a sermon should do. And when, I'm, when we're looking to this, we're looking to the gospel, the overall nature of the gospel message for the direction of the sermon. In, a, in addition to what Richard Lisher with how Crum anticipated Lisher and the others. Crum also anticipated my own work in four pages of the sermon. My background is the United Church of Canada, of course, and, and when I first wrote at length about law and gospel in 1988, it was one of several tensions, several creative tensions that can be in a sermon. I, I used uh, uh, the image of a telephone generator from an old farm crank telephone. And, and if, you, if you take, we had one of these in our grade 13 physics class. Uh, we would stand around in a circle and, and the teacher would, would crank the generator and we would hold hands and we could feel the current flowing through us. And, uh, and uh, to a point where we finally had to let go. But he, he took the wires and, and held them at a distance. Someone was cranking the generator and 
when he, they were at this distance, nothing was happening. We couldn't see anything, couldn't hear anything. But at this distance, a spark would jump from here over to here, positive to negative. And, and uh, it was a, like a mini streak of lightning. And you could hear the thunder, the snap of it. And then there was nothing, and, and as the generator continued to turn and the charge continued to build up, then there was another shot. But as you brought these wires closer, the, the, the spark between them became continuous and became brighter and brighter until they were just very close to each other. And when you touched the wires, the spark disappeared. I think that's a good image of imagination. Certainly it's a good image of how language works. Our language can function as metaphor and, and something that's exciting and interesting to hear as long as two things are brought together that normally wouldn't be said adjacent to one another. But by their being adjacent, by what S.T. Coleridge called the juxtaposition of opposites, there is a kind of reconciliation of opposites. That there's a new relationship that, is, that has a spark and it's interesting to see. What happens with our language, of course, language is all originally a metaphor, and then it eventually kind of caves in, and we no longer notice the metaphor. Barry was telling me that the, uh, uh, the, the name of the point across the way is Blomidon, and, and uh, I've asked several people here if they know what the word Blomidon means, and they say no, and Barry told me what it means, so I told them. It means blow me down. Blow me down. And, and because because we've lost the metaphor, we've lost the spark, and, and we're just talking at the level of decayed language, of where, where the words simply have a literal kind of meaning, but, but no metaphor possibility. What we're doing when we preach, we're trying to take these texts and make them come alive again with a certain spark. They, they, they lie there almost dead, as it were, and yet we know that this word, the Bible, is a living word. To preach it as a dead word is a heresy. But it only becomes a live word if, as we ourselves encounter Jesus Christ in and through it and begin living the word that he has given to us. Well, it's the same kind of relationship that exists between law and gospel or trouble and grace. It's a tensive relationship. It isn't that kind of manipulative, mechanical thing that C.F.W. Walters was talking about in the 1800s with law and gospel. The gospel makes you feel guilty, uh, or rather the law makes you feel guilty and the gospel makes you feel better. It's a tensive relationship, the same kind of tensive relationship we're talking about in the first and second half of the sermon, where, where Neither one erases the other, but because there is a tension there, there's an energy there. There's a, a possibility of, of salvation as we work out our salvation between these two poles. Yes, I am a sinner, and yes, I am saved. So, that's one of the changes that's taken place, that law and gospel have now exist in a tensive relationship rather than a mechanical one. And thus, the, the shape of the sermon is being guided now, if one chooses to follow this approach, it's not being guided by the shape of an individual text or pericope. It can be. But rather, the shape of the sermon is guided by the gospel message. Because as preachers, our task is not to preach an individual text. Our task is to preach the gospel, and an individual text gives us the opening to preach the gospel. But it's the gospel that we're proclaiming. It's the larger Christian story. And the larger Christian story, the biblical story, moves from the expulsion from Eden at the beginning of the Bible to the New Jerusalem at the end of the Bible. From the Exodus to the Promised Land not the other way around, from Good Friday to Easter, from crucifixion to resurrection. Each of these is a paradigm for, for how we might view trouble and grace in the sermon. There's a natural movement of the faith, of the gospel message, that shapes the sermon when we move from trouble to grace. Well, um... Uh...
one of the things that uh, Crum talks about is, is the uh, conspicuous structure on, the, on your sheet. He, he says that we are trying to articulate and examine a hermeneutical process whose structure not only parallels the structure of the sermon design, but also the structure of the overall plot of the biblical story. And his, he talks about a conspicuous structure that is in his preaching, which is going to be situation, complication, and resolution. We've already discussed those. But I didn't realize until going back this year in the fall and actually wading through Crumb in a detail that I had not wanted to do before, that in fact he anticipates even these four pages that we were talking about, because he talks about biblical situation and complication, present situation and complication, biblical gospel resolution and present gospel resolution, much in the way that I talk about page one of the sermon is trouble in the Bible, page two is trouble in our world, Page three is grace in the biblical text. That's where the theme sentence needs to be focused on in particular. You start developing the theme sentence that focuses on God and one of the persons of the Trinity. There's uh, one negative assessment that I would want to make of Crum, and that is that his situation complication resolution encourages something of that old understanding that I'm wanting to get away from, that that, God, that law and gospel or trouble and grace is problem solution. His resolution sounds to me too much like solution when what we should be thinking of is that relationship with God. Well, I think we've, we've probably covered uh, most of what I wanted to cover. I did want to come back to that, that uh, rich young man. We last saw him driving his BMW over the horizon and uh, Effectively, he's, he's driving right out of the New Testament. We never see him again. And that's the kind of text that we would say, well, you know, there really isn't a good news to that text, so where's the grace in that? Um, and, and yet we, we still have that contradictory element from the text that Jesus looked at him, and he loved him. He looked at him, and he loved him. Loved him not for what he could be, loved him for who he was. So there's a contradiction within the text that Jesus, who loves this young man for everything that he is, sends him off to change. Get rid of your BMW, get rid of all your wealth, and then, and then come and follow me, and rich will be your reward in heaven. He's sending him off to something he cannot do, so my contention is that we, if we just preach the pericope, we do say that's the end of the story, and we can only preach a word of judgment on that and, uh, and on all similar people who, who look to their own resources for their salvation. Look to, not to Jesus' way, but, but to their own way of, of resorting to working out their salvation. But that is not consistent with the gospel as I understand it. And that is why I would say that this, this young man goes and he, he checks into Heartbreak Hotel. It's the place, that, it's the hotel that, that everyone, everyone who, who has, who wants to work out their salvation in their own way ends up going to. It doesn't matter whether you're going to work out your salvation with drugs or with sex or with, with, with wealth or, 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 or with academic endeavor or with works of righteousness, wh however you think that you're going to work out your own salvation separate from Jesus Christ, you go to Heartbreak Hotel. And at the end of each of the Gospels, Mark in particular, or no less than any of the others, Jesus goes to Heartbreak Hotel himself. He goes to where we have registered ourselves, he goes to where the rich man has gone, and he dies for him, and for you, and for me. And if, if Jesus didn't die for that rich man, then Jesus didn't die for you, and didn't die for me, 
In other words, it isn't the end of the story when we get to the end of the pericope. The end of the rich man's story is at the end of the gospel. And it's in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so it is the end of each of our stories, too. And the end of all time. I think we have time for some questions. Gary, if people want to come forward, or what do you want to do?